My final item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 12902 in the name of Rhoda Grant on UK National Stocking Awareness Day. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put, and I would invite those members who wish to take part in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And Ms Grant, if you are ready, uh, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I have pleasure in bringing forward um, this debate tonight to highlight National Stocking Awareness Day, which took place on Saturday, the 18th of April 2015. The first of UK's National Stocking Awareness Days took place just back in 2012, when organisations in Scotland, England and Wales united to mark the day to highlight their work to help put a stop to stocking. The event has grown with public sector as well as charities now participating in this National Stocking Awareness Day annually. This year, the day is being marked by a series of events this week to raise awareness of stocking. And I can't talk about stocking or indeed mark the day without paying tribute to the work of Anne Moulds, who has campaigned on stocking. It was Anne that persuaded me to bring forward amendments to the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Bill back in 2010 to make stocking a crime in Scotland. Um, however, she has not stopped there. She continues to campaign and raise awareness of stocking. Anne was a victim herself. Um, she could have allowed that to daunt her, but instead she has fought for legislation and recognition of the trauma stocking can cause, ensuring that help and support is available to people who suffer stocking. She set up Action Scotland Against Stocking and chairs the, national, uh, the Scottish National Stocking Group. So I really want to pay tribute to her bringing this forward and making sure that it's very much at the forefront of the public consciousness. Um, this year, National Stocking Awareness Day foc focuses on young people. A school stocking poster was designed by Ayrshire College creative arts student Leone, Leone Smith. The poster, which raises awareness of stocking, will be sent to every school, college and university throughout the UK. The aim is to encourage young people to seek help if they are being stalked. Research has shown that stalkers are often, often mistaken for bullies by parents, teachers and indeed the police. And while, while bullying is extremely serious, it's different from stalking. Stalkers tend to obsess about their victims and carry out a pattern of be behaviour. Individually, the actions would often appear innocent, but together they can be absolutely terrifying. The aim of this year's events is to raise awareness among young people to make sure they know what stalking is and how to recognise it. It's important that young people know how to protect themselves and indeed to seek protection of the law. In an age where social media is used regularly, we sometimes give more information on those platforms than we would have given in any other mode of communication. In 2014, Action Scotland Against Stalking launched an award-winning schools DVD called Friend Request to help young people recognise the dangers of stalking online. Anne tells me that every time the film has been shown, a young person has plucked up the courage to disclose that they have experienced similar behaviours. The aim of the exercise is to raise awareness and also to highlight how stalking has links to other abusive behaviour, behaviour such as bullying, paedophilia, sexual exploitation and indeed revenge porn. Until recently we had never heard about revenge porn but now it is rife. Intimate pictures taken in a consensual relationship are then shared on the internet without the permission of the participants. Ellie Hutchison has pioneered much of the work to end revenge porn for Scottish Women's Aid. She's worked hard to illustrate that revenge porn is in itself a form of stalking and has to be tackled. I very much welcome moves by various agencies to address this um, as a real and serious issue. We do need legislation that deals with this and other forms of cyber abuse. It's important that young people recognise the signs of predatory behaviour online as well as in day-to-day -day life so that they can take steps to raise the alarm and indeed to protect themselves. Many cyber bullies are guilty of stalking and the law is there to protect people of all ages from this insidious crime. Stalking continues to be a problem in Scotland. However, we, have we now have legislation to protect victims. But despite this, we have recently seen cases where legislation has been powerless. If a perpetrator is unfit to stand trial, it appears that the law is powerless to protect the victim. 
That cannot be the case. The law must be there for the protection of victims, and there must be ways of making sure that someone unfit to stand trial gets the help and support they require while making sure they are unable to perpetrate abuse on their victim. And I'm glad the Scottish Government is consulting on this. However, I'm unsure if the proposal of access to criminal non-harassment orders will serve the purpose, given that these are criminal charges and must also go through the criminal courts. Hopefully, responses to the consultation will indicate a better way forward that looks after the vulnerable but protects victims. We have come a long way in recognising the problem of stalking, but there is also a long way to go to protect victims. I hope this debate tonight helps raise awareness in some way that will lead to better support for victims of stalking. Many thanks. And I now call on Kenny McCaskill to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Four minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Could I, first of all, in the usual manner, thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this uh, important debate and indeed pay tribute to her, not simply for her contribution, and I echo the comments she's made, but the work that she's carried out on this issue, in particular in 2010 and before, but the work in related matters relating to the uh, protection uh, of women, children and the vulnerable. Equally, I would also echo her comments and praise for Anne Moulds. Uh, she has been uh, pivotal and deserves praise for the entire chamber uh, in achieving the legislation that we have on stocking. Uh, I think it would be fair to say that if it hadn't been for Anne Moulds, then it's unlikely that we would probably have uh, that legislation. Uh, she pursued it tirelessly, uh, having been a victim herself, uh, and despite the trauma that she had undergone, uh, despite the fact that uh, many other people would simply have wanted to have got on with their lives, she recognised uh, the need to try and ensure uh, that no other people went Went through it, and if they did, that they would be given access to justice. Uh, she pursued it. Also, it has to be said, sometimes in the face of institutional inertia, and as the then Justice Secretary, I have to take my share of accountability for that. Uh, but she certainly shook up the foundations in police, prosecutors, and indeed uh, the government, where there was initially a mantra chant that the current legislative procedures applied, that no additional legislation was necessary, that breach of the peace or other forms. Uh, uh, of uh, legal action were available. Uh, she managed, I think, to drive a wedge uh, through that, and certainly she was pivotal in persuading me of the necessity uh, for specific action, and as a consequence, I think she changed those in police prosecution and officialdom. It is a dreadful offence, and equally it comes in a whole myriad of ways, uh, and it's carried out by numerous people against again, a whole uh, broad and spectrum of society, which is why I think it's appropriate that it shouldn't simply be viewed as an offence by men upon women uh, and the raising of awareness for children is appropriate. And the points made by Rhoda Grant about revenge porn are equally appropriate. There's perhaps from Hollywood movies or TV shows a presumption that stalking is some person that you don't know who either phones and has heavy breathing and you never hear or see from them or some almost masked individual in the twilight uh, following a woman home. The likelihood is that you'll probably know the person who's stalking you. Equally, it's not necessarily the case that they'll present a knife at your throat or carry out any uh, perhaps acts of violence. Sometimes a consequence of that is it's not viewed as particularly troublesome. The, perhaps the perception of authority might be, why don't you just ignore it or get over it, or it's only a few phone calls, or it's all right, it's an awful lot of emails or letters or whatever. So sometimes there has been an element within, I think, uh, perhaps uh, those who should be looking after the interests of those who are suffering from it, that it clearly doesn't register on the scale. It's certainly not a, a serious assault. But the effects upon the individual are manifest and severe, which is why how it comes in whatever manifestation. The new electronic media has opened up a whole variety of ways. Revenge porn is another aspect to it, not simply turning up at people's work or place, following them home or whatever else. And it's appropriate, therefore, that we have to take action. Equally, I have to say, it would be remiss of me not to say that the action that has to be taken has to be built upon. I fully understand why the legislative timescale and process are such that action cannot be taken at the present moment on corroboration. But I think it would be fair to say that victims of stalking, as with victims of sexual offences, as indeed the elderly or other children who suffer abuse in silence, in isolation, will not get access to justice unless we do tackle the routine requirement for corroboration. 
Most aspects of stocking will not be done in public, they will be done in private. So we have done a lot as a chamber, and Rhoda Grant deserves great credit along with Anne Moulds in terms of a specific piece of legislation uh, to tackle uh, uh, stalking. But we do have to ensure that access to justice is there uh, for those who, even with the raising of awareness, even with the driving home of the message that it won't be uh, contemplated or indeed uh, condoned in any shape or form by courts or prosecutors, we do have to assure that access to justice is there and justice will be delivered. Uh, so again, it's thanks to Rhoda Grant for raising this issue. And once again, uh, thanks to the irrepressible, tireless campaigning of Anne Moles, who deserves our greatest thanks for the action that she has taken. Many no, thanks. Now call on Margaret McCulloch to be followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, President Officer. In beginning, I also want to congratulate Rhoda Grant for securing this debate on National Stock and Awareness Day, which took place last week. She has brought an important issue to the Parliament, and I would also commend her for doing so. Stalking is an intrusion, and it's even an invasion. It's sometimes difficult to define, but I think we all accept that no one should have to live in fear or distress because of the behaviour of others. Stalking is unwelcome, unsettling, and in many cases it's recurring, sometimes overtly menacing, and while anyone could be a victim, it's twice as likely to affect women than men. Women's Aid describes stalking as one of the most frequently experienced types of abuse, and that is why I believe there has to be a robust response and a deeper awareness and understanding of the problem. I also want to touch on cyber-stalking and how technology is changing physical stalking too. There is a variety of behaviours that we can consider to be stalking, loitering, sending unwanted calls or messages, or being over-friendly with a victim. I worry that victims might feel that, in isolation, some of this behaviour seems more strange and unusual than disturbing or threatening. I worry they feel they have to wait until a more discernible pattern of behaviour emerges over time until they seek advice or go to the police. If the actions of a stalker make anyone feel fear or concern, then I would hope they would report the matter as soon as they can. And I hope that the police respond sensitively and effectively. But just as the actions of a stalker can be hard to define, sometimes their behaviour towards their victims is more obvious, more pernicious and more aggressive. Threatening or obscene calls and messages, falling and surveillance, interfering with someone's mail or belongings, invading someone's personal space, invading their home and physical aggression. Nobody should have to live in fear because of that kind of behaviour or the behaviour that it leads to, not least our young people. The focus of this year's National Stock and Awareness Day on the risk to young people allows us to think about personal safety in a world that is more connected through social media and online interaction. There has been a concerted and commendable effort to make young people aware of cyberbullying and how behaviour on these platforms has a real impact in the real world. But we have to develop a better and broader understanding of cyber stalking too. Just as the internet is another means for us to communicate with each other and share our lives with each other, Sadly, it's also another medium for stalkers to exploit. It's another way for them to send unsolicited or abusive messages, blackmail or to seek proximity to someone by using technology and gathering the information people place online. The National Stalking, Stalking Helpline advises their callers to change their passwords regularly and to keep their antivirus software up to date. They have warned about the dangers of stalking using malware or keylogging software to break through our cybersecurity and target their victims further. There are reports of stalkers ordering items online to be delivered to the homes of their victims and using geolocation features and apps to find out where their victims is or where they've been. For the generation who use these apps most and for whom technology is such a big part of their lives, we have to communicate the significance of cyber safety. It has never been so important. Presiding officer, Women's Aid tell the story of Chandra in their digital stock and awareness materials, and I think it's a story the Chamber needs to hear. Chandra left her violent husband and fled to a secret location, but her husband found her 
and started stalking her at her new address. He knew all her movements, what she was doing and where she'd been. Her husband had installed spyware on her mobile phone and from that he'd been able to pinpoint her location, watch her through her camera and even listen to her through the handset. Presiding officer, I believe society as a whole needs an education in how pernicious stalking can be in today's world. And for that reason, I would applaud the efforts of all those who have participated in National Stalking Awareness Day. Thank you. And thank you. I now call on Margaret Mitchell to be followed by Elaine Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank Rhoda Grant for bringing this important debate to the Chamber this evening. The fact that one in six women and one in 12 men are stalked at some point during their lives is alarming. This debate presents a welcome opportunity, therefore, to raise awareness about this dangerous and deeply damaging form of harassment. The extent of the problem faced by female students in universities and colleges across the UK was highlighted in the 2010 National Union of Students Hidden Marks report. It found that one quarter of stalking victims reported that the obsessive behaviour they had been subjected to had affected their mental health, their studies and their relationships. More worryingly still, the findings state that only one in five victims reported the incident to either the institution or the police. The main reason given for not reporting incidents was that the victim didn't believe the incident was serious enough to report. To mark National Stalking Awareness Day, the Susie Lamplu Trust has released a two-minute animated film looking at what stalking is and offering support for those who are experiencing it. The video firmly rejects any misguided notions that stalking is trivial, flattering or romantic. Instead, it portrays it for what it is, namely a very serious crime, which can take the form of sending disturbing and often distressing emails, making non-stop phone calls and engaging in social media abuse. Crucially, the film makes it clear that more than 80% of victims are stalked by someone they know, with the majority of perpetrators being ex-partners. Stalking is clearly a form of abuse which can have devastating consequences in terms of undermining the victim's sense of security and their ability to live a life without fear. In the worst cases, some victims have driven to remove themselves from the electoral register for fear of being traced by the stalker. Hence, fundamental freedoms such as the right to vote and the right to live without fear, which the rest of us take for granted, are denied them. It is therefore incomprehensible that the Scottish Government has chosen to exclude stalking statistics from its crime statistics. To spell this out, the government's claim that crime is at a 40-year low does not take into account thousands of incidents, including stalking, which are categorised as offences rather than crimes, and only crimes are included in the, this 40-headline uh, year low claim. Furthermore, in the government's own statistical bulletin published in November last year, stalking is merely categorised as one of a number of miscellaneous offences, which also includes breach of the peace and offensive behaviour at football matches. If this wasn't bad enough, it was revealed last week that there are reports of some police officers trying to dissuade victims of these offences from pursuing complaints by warning them that they have to go to court to testify. Presiding officer, stalking is a serious, a serious crime which blights victims' life with often long-term consequences it should be recognised as such. So the National Stalking Awareness Day, seeking as it does to raise awareness of what constitutes stalking is, uh, and its dev 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 devastating effects, is both timely and welcome. Many thanks. I now call on Elaine Smith, after which we move to closing speech from the Minister. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer, and as others have done, can I commend my colleague and friend Rhoda Grant on bringing this important issue to the Chamber and also on the tireless work that she does on issues of violence against women and children 
more generally. Um, and I want to join her in recognising National Stocking Awareness Day and, uh, and the fact that this year emphasis is being put on stocking amongst young people. Well, stocking is not exclusively a women's issue. Um, it does, as I understand, disproportionately affect women, with one in six women being stalked at some point in their lives and young women being particularly affected. Stalking can manifest in a number of ways, as Rhoda Grant pointed out in her motion, and it needs to be taken seriously. Stalking is not romantic, it's not trivial or funny, it's worrying, it's serious and it's illegal. And contrary to common belief, most stalkers are former partners or friends of victims or are somehow known to them, as both Kenny McCaskill and uh, Margaret McCulloch noted earlier in the debate. The British Crime Survey shows that threatening phone calls and letters are the most uh, common types of stalking behaviour, but victims can also experience being followed and being spied on. An example of that was uh, illustrated by Margaret McCulloch. And some have had their homes broken into or been the victims of violent behaviour. Um, Rhoda Grant also mentioned cyber stalking, as did other members in the debate. And there's no doubt that advances in technology have led to a huge increase in cyber stalking. And that's a particular issue for young people and students, given the high level of social media use amongst uh, the younger age groups. And whilst it's not a, a physical stalking method, it can be just as intimidating. And I think we know as elected members the level of abuse and vitriol that can be directed towards people online. Also, according to domestic violence charity Women's Aid, 41% of women reported that a partner or an ex had tracked them down through their online activities, and 36% of those women claimed that they felt threatened by such behaviour. And I want to take the opportunity um, at this point to say that it's important that Women's Aid receive support for the vital work that they do and I was therefore pleased to note today that Scottish Labour's Women's Manifesto committed to investing over £2 million in women's aid centres across Scotland. In drawing to a conclusion, presiding officer, I think we have to acknowledge that uh, any kind of bullying is unacceptable and can lead to tragedy. And in particular, young victims of, of bullying can take to self-harming um, or even committing suicide can be the tragic outcome of that. However, stalking can be a particularly extreme form of bullying and can commonly involve violent and even murderous behaviour. Therefore, it's important that victims of stalking, particularly young people, are supported, that they're educated on what stalking is and how it can be reported, as mentioned by Margaret Mitchell earlier, um, as the report Hidden Marks highlighted. Further, we must ensure that there are strong links between the police, NHS, student unions and specialist voluntary services to make that process easier for the victim. So I would simply like to, uh, now to echo the sentiments of the motion, which says that bullying in its most severe form is stalking. And I would once again wish to congratulate Rhoda Grant on bringing this important issue to the Chamber this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we now move to closing speech and I call on Marco Biaggi, Minister, seven minutes or thereby, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I uh, want to join the, the chorus of people that have uh, recognised uh, Rhoda Grant for securing this member's debate to highlight the scourge of stalking and to give this important issue the time that it deserves in the Chamber. And I absolutely support the sentiment of the motion which recognises the severity of stalking and its effect on adults and young people alike. And I agree with her remarks in, the opening, uh, in her opening contribution that it is important to keep in mind the distinction between bullying, which is unacceptable behaviour, and stalking, which is a criminal offence. The, the National Union of Students' Hidden Marks report published in 2010 provides a real sense of the damaging effects of stalking on young women. The report states that 12% of women students who participated in their national online survey between August 2009 and uh, March 2010 reported being subject to stalking. Almost 90% of perpetrators in those cases were men, and most were known to their victim. And this is broadly in line with other findings. For example, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey in 2012-13 found that 8% of 16 to 24-year-olds and 10% of 25 to 34-year-olds had experienced at least one form of stalking or harassing behaviour in the last 12 months. And as we've already heard, 
stalkers can exhibit a wide range of behaviours. They can follow victims, they can send unwanted messages and gifts, they can damage property. As Margaret McCulloch pointed out, they can invade homes. And as many people have highlighted, the opening up of the online sphere of human interaction has just created, in many ways, new opportunities for these behaviours to manifest. And it was Kenny McCaskill that pointed out that in the past, perhaps, the sense that each of these acts individually can, to some official eyes, appear trivial, has led the issue not to be taken as seriously as it should have. But when viewed through the eyes of the victim of stalking, they take on a new form, they take on a chilling form, and they are undisputable in their severity. And contrary to the popular perception of stalkers as strangers who obsessively watch and follow their victims, in reality, as Margaret Mitchell pointed out, most stalkers, we believe, are known to their victim. And indeed, stalking can be perpetrated by the victim's partner or ex-partner as part of a broader part pattern of abusive and controlling behaviour. The linkages to wider issues of violence against women are clear. And for those who experience stalking, it can have a massive impact on lives, cause considerable fear and distress. And of those women students who reported stalking in the, NH in the NUS survey, one quarter said it had affected their mental health, their studies and relationships. And in the most serious cases, the most serious cases, stalking can be precursor to serious assault, rape or even murder. So we have supported strengthening the criminal law to deal with stalking. We supported the amendments brought forward by Rhoda Grant, which led to the introduction of the statutory stalking offence in 2010. And the maximum penalty when tried on indictment is five years in prison. And we're currently consulting on a whole number of measures to further strengthen the criminal law in a number of areas around violence against women. Uh, whether a new offence, for example, is required to better reflect the true nature of domestic abuse as experienced by victims, including patterns of coercive and controlling behaviour, and a new specific offence related to the non-consensual sharing of intimate images, what is commonly referred to as revenge porn. This is on top of funding commitments announced on 28th of March that we will invest an additional £20 million over the next three years to tackle and better support victims of violence against women, which is in itself on top of record funding for initiatives to tackle violence against women, with £11.8 million allocated for 2015-16. Stalking is different to bullying. It's an issue we take very seriously. Bullying of any kind is unacceptable, must be tackled quickly wherever it arises, whether it's in the home, the workplace or school. And we want every child and young person in Scotland to grow up free from bullying. We want them to develop respectful, responsible, confident relationships with other children, with young people and adults. And so it is important that there is that clear distinction. Stalking is criminal and about people, usually men, using it to establish power and control over their victims. And sexual assault and exploitation are not types of bullying, they are abuse. Although these behaviours may start out as bullying, we must ensure that our children and young people and society as a whole understand that sexually aggressive behaviour and bullying are completely unacceptable and that the consequences of taking part in either can be serious without confusing the two. And we do not believe that criminal behaviour such as stalking, domestic abuse, rape, sexual assault are inevitable. Preventing this offending behaviour requires us to take action to challenge the negative attitudes, the societal power struggles which often underpin it. We are supporting work in schools by Mentors in Violence Prevention, MVP Scotland, an approach to gender violence which aims to equip our young people with an understanding of what constitutes healthy relationships and creates an environment where negative behaviours can be challenged and that that is part of everybody's uh, contribution and role. We're also supporting a partnership led by Respect Me and a range of partners from Rape Crisis Scotland, Zero Tolerance and SEOP which aims to raise awareness of gender-based issues including bullying, harassment and violence. And since the offence of stalking was introduced in October 2010, the number of offences recorded by police in Scotland 
we can see from the figures, has increased year on year. There were 875 in 2013-14, a 45% increase on the 605 offences in the previous year. But we believe this is due to more victims of stalking, having the confidence in the police and our criminal justice system that was highlighted by a range of speakers as vital to ensure that these crimes are reported and can be tackled. The figures will go up before they go down, but they must go down and they will go down. We should all recognise the devastating effect of stalking on victims and we should continue in this chamber and beyond working to eradicate it and all other forms of violence against women. Many thanks and thank you all for taking part in this important debate and I now close this meeting of Parliament. <laughs>